Hello everybody. Uh, I want to get into our second of the Oak lectures and this is barrel maintenance and how to maintain and take care of your barrels. And the first thing we really want to focus on is how clean is your bunghole? This is really the filthiest place on an entire barrel. Um, and so one thing we're going to talk about is make sure that we keep um, our bunghole nice and clean and that uh, reduces our risk of infection for any reason inside of our barrel. Um, insert your joke here uh, because this is how you power wash a bunghole. Um, end of jokes, moving on. What is the best protocol for storing barrels? So I think the first thing I want to talk about is how do we store barrels? Well, the best thing you could do is keep them full all of the time and schedule your bottling around, you know, racking and blending. Um, unfortunately, um, that's not the best, you know, you can't always do that. So what do we have to do if we have to store the barrel? So the first thing we have to do is we have to wash them. Uh, a power washer situation is the best, especially with uh, hot water. Um, steam is highly effective against Britannomyces and bacteria. Um, and when we steam, we're going to want to talk about the things that we need to do in order to make sure that we, we steam pretty well. Other treatments don't really seem to do a whole lot. Uh, there was a study by Randy Warbro and Rich Desenzo uh, from ETS, Randy Warbro's out of uh, Cornell, and they looked at the uh, effectiveness of different treatments of ozone and just hot water, and then they also did chlorine dioxide for whatever reason, and none of them had any effect uh, against uh, Britannomyces in particular, except for steam. And uh, pasteurization does seem to have an effect uh, at keeping it down. Uh, so when we had that tour with, uh, you know, where we talked about how we maintain Brett, you know, populations down, just uh, using steam seems to be the most uh, potent tool the winemaker has to keep barrels uh, clean. Uh, and then SO2 gas is highly effective, and we'll talk about gassing barrels. And the combination of using steam uh, followed by cooling and SO2 is highly recommended. Um, but I want to make sure that you know that you need to cool your barrels afterwards and allow your barrels to dry one or two days. Um, and then uh, then you go ahead and add a little bit more gas uh, after it's cool. Again, more in a minute. So um, cleaning barrels. After you've racked clean, sound wine. So these is when we're talking about like non um, infected barrels. And one of the things you want to do is if you do have an infected barrel, uh, you have something that's going on, going wrong. Take that wine out and quarantine it. Get it away from the rest of the wine in your winery and then quarantine that barrel. Get rid of it. And if there's a problem uh, in that barrel, it's going to come back. There's really no way to fully pasteurize a barrel unless you can somehow uh, increase the temperature and steam it long enough to get it to close to 200 degrees all the way through the, the barrel uh, itself, which in that case, then it would work. Um, if you could manage to get the entire barrel save up to maybe 150 degrees and hold it there for about an hour, that would be effective uh, to pasteurize the, the barrel. So some sort of hot water circulation or something like that where you could literally pasteurize the barrel, but that's pretty hard to do. Um, <clears throat> so first thing we're gonna do, clean wine. Let's pretend the barrel's not infected. Empty the barrel of contents. Step two, rinse barrel of hot, non-chlorinated water, uh, best with a high pressure washer. You guys have all seen this done. And then step three, uh, is best is to uh, go ahead and do some sort of sanita sanitation step. Again, steam is ideal. Ozone probably doesn't do much, uh, but it is a nice extra step um, just to take care of any surface uh, bacteria because ozone doesn't have the ability to penetrate really, uh, but some people use it. If you do use ozone, you've got to wait 30, 40 minutes, if not four or five hours for that ozone to break down or you have to rinse the barrel. And again, wait 20, 30 minutes after you rinse the barrel because uh, ozone's a powerful oxidizer and then you refill your barrel. So after you empty them um, and you're gonna store them, uh, same kind of thing, go ahead and take it through the, the emptying process, uh, wash the barrel and again, sanitize with steam and then uh, let it cool and then uh, gas with sulfur dioxide. And there's a couple of ways to gas for uh, gas barrels with sulfur dioxide. Um, there are two ways to do it. Uh, the old school way is sulfur wicks and the more modern way is with sulfur gas. And we'll talk about the advantages and disadvantages of both of those. Gassing with pure SO2 gas is really easy. Uh, less than 10 seconds per barrel, you get a fairly measured dose. And there's no residual, like actual physical sulfur from wicks. Wicks can actually drip physical sulfur in the barrel. 
The disadvantage is, if you want to call it that, you have to have a pesticide applicator permit. I think you even have to have the permit to purchase the gas. Um, the gas and hoses itself are really expensive. Just a canister of gas is a couple hundred dollars, and the hoses and everything else to be non-corrosive and everything else costs a couple hundred dollars as well, and they still tend to wear out. So uh, because SO2 gas is so corrosive, uh, SO2 gas is not worth messing around with. It's very toxic. You have to have uh, special respirators and eye protection. Um, it's really not fun stuff to play with. Um, if you're going to gas, always gas outdoors. Never gas inside. I mean, wherever you're at, just try and do it outside. Long-term exposure has all sorts of uh, problems with it. So, you know, make sure you've got a good respirator, self-contained breathing apparatus, something along those lines uh, to make sure that it's, uh, uh, you're not really breathing this stuff in. And then before you use it, it's a really good idea to rinse with cold water because SO2 absorbs into cold water. So if you have a barrel that's been filled, it's a good idea with sulfur recently, and it's still got a strong odor, uh, you want to rinse that out with water beforehand. Um, or in fact, you may give your wine a little SO2 addition. But the bigger issue is that you'll be standing there filling the barrel, probably won't be wearing your respirator, or maybe one of your cellar hands won't be wearing a respirator, and then they'll sit and breathe it in, and that can just really create an unpleasant situation for whoever. So now we're going to talk about gassing with SO2 wicks and discs. You can buy these pretty easily. Um, they sell them at most uh, local places. You can pick them up and buy them. And basically you just light a disc on fire and you drop it into uh, uh, on a little hanger inside of the barrel and let it burn. Uh, it's pretty inexpensive. You do not need a pesticide license to do this. Uh, the downside is, is that if these drip in the barrel, uh, and then they, you'll end up with a really stinky ferment. And then that stinky ferment kind of can go on to create some sulfate compounds and other things like that. But that's also sort of a trick that can be used in some regions because that hydrogen sulfide, if you can get it to bind up the right way, kind of shows as a nice minerality in the wine. Um, and some of the things that we've decided that are uh, quote unquote minerality in wine are due to sulfur, you know, uh, hydrogen sulfide based and sulfide based compounds. Um, you still need to wear a respirator of some kind, some sort of scrubber. It's really slow. It takes a long time to set up a barrel and burn one wick at a time. Um, again, never perform this inside, especially because you're lighting things on fire. That should go without saying. Um, and again, same kind of things is that you, you know, long-term exposure to doing this is not really good for you. You don't want to be re breathing sulfur dioxide gas on a regular basis. So SO2 has been around forever. It's highly dangerous in its gaseous form. It's an antimicrobial. It'll kill you too. Um, but it's been approved for well, since Roman times and still going. Um, actually, even Egyptian times, you know, three, 4,000 years we've been using it. And we know that it works. Um, an interesting idea that I had with a talk I had with a guy named David Ramey is he doesn't even wash his barrels. And he does all native ferments. Um, what he does is he just dumps them out and then goes ahead and gasses right away. Uh, in order to make sure that the wine barrels still have uh, a really low pH to keep that gas in place. And then he only does a good power wash before he goes into them. Uh, kind of an interesting thought, just throw it out there. Um, Dave Ramey makes some good wine, so uh, hard for me to uh, you know go back on that. Um, the other thing is uh, we also want to let you know that using SO2 helps to release some of those lactones and things like that. So if you want to get some more caramel and things like that, uh, using SO2 gas is really good. Um, you can't use it on any stainless steel. As a matter of fact, it will pit it. So uh, keep it away from stainless. It will eat through it. Um, and then it's too hazardous in proper concentration to be a day-to-day -day sanitizer. So, um, you know, where we see people using uh, a peroxide, uh, like a, a sodium per, you know, percarbonate wash, and cleaning and then rinse and then you know citric and sulfur have been used for the longest time it's not particularly effective as a sanitizer in that state it's not strong enough so uh we see the peroxides working a little bit better and they're not as hazardous uh so like parasitic acid not as, as toxic as breathing so2 all the time um it's a good probably necessary part of an overall sanitation program especially if you're having barrels using so2 gas is going to be something that you're going to have to do um, as an anecdote, thing you can do is uh, dump a little tartaric acid in the bottom of a barrel, uh, maybe about 10 grams, and then throw about 10 grams of potassium and bisulfide in there with a little bit of uh, uh, water and sort of sh shake that around a bit. And that'll release SO2 gas too. And uh, you can gas a barrel in that way. It's not as good as either of the dry gas forms because you're leaving some liquid in the container. Um, and a lot of times that doesn't get rinsed out all the way. 
but uh, it is a, a another route of action to get some gas in your barrels if you're, you know, like a home winemaker or something. I wouldn't recommend it for production usage. SO2 safety, real quick, uh, we want to require uh, that license to have it. It's a simple license to get. You can get it, only take you uh, a day to do it. Um, Importantly, when you breathe this in your lungs, it creates uh, sulfuric acid and will burn you from the inside out. It hurts a lot. Uh, I've done it. I've been burned by it. Don't let it happen. So again, mask up, stay safe. <clears throat> so now we've got to the point where we store our barrels and they've been sitting around for a while and they dry out. Um, and so we want to talk about how you properly hydrate a barrel. And so you're seeing a technique here called heads and tails, and this is uh, the best way to hydrate a barrel. So there's a couple ways to do it. Hydration option number one is cold water, high volume. is just completely fill the barrel with cold chlor chlorine-free water and let the barrel hydrate and soak for 24 to 48 hours. That's it. Check for leakage. It'll take a long time. Um, Total hydration time is going to take you a couple of days. This is not going to be quick. So one of the things that I like to do personally, if I can, and we have time before vintage, is I really like to fill up our barrels with water. This isn't exactly the best usage of water, but fill them with water and then load them up with a little bit of uh, acid and some SO2, um, maybe you know 40 or 50 grams of acid, uh, tartaric acid is, is good, and then uh, SO2 and uh, maybe 10 grams of SO2, 20 grams of SO2, something like that. Um, usually it's a really uh, high tech dosage, but you know, going with something along the lines of a Dixie cup full of SO2 and a Dixie cup full of, of potassium metal isulfite, a Dixie cup full of tartaric acid. Um, and that way we've got some uh, pretty low pH sulfured water in the barrel and that's keeping those barrels hydrated until when we need them. So when it's time to go ahead and, and use that barrel, you can empty that water out and you know, you know rinse it real quick and go right to the barrel and you'll have all your hydrated barrels, not something you'll have to stop and take labor time for in the middle of vintage to hydrate barrels. Hydration option two, and this is pretty much the best way to do it, um, is uh, to fill the barrel with three to five gallons of hot water, the hottest possible water you can get. Um, or if you have a steamer, you can just steam a barrel and steaming a barrel is the fastest way to hydrate a barrel. Um, but the thing to do is to uh, lay, lay the barrel up on either heads or tails. And on the, so you put it up on its side and you fill the head on in the inside with hot water and the head on the outside with hot water. And the reason you want to do this is the driving force that kind of swells a barrel is the head. And so getting that head in place puts the pressure on the staves to, to go ahead and swell up. So this helps and it goes a little bit faster, but still you're looking at six to eight hours. So these are things you want to start the day before you're going to fill your barrels, uh, because the last thing you want to do is be sitting there on the crush pad at nine o'clock at night trying to deal with a, a barrel that's uh, not swollen yet. And so this is that idea of uh, steaming your barrels. And the way you want to do that is you want to steam that barrel with really, really hot water and do the tails for 20 minutes. And you can hydrate a barrel in under an hour if you use steam. Uh, so this is why a lot of people have steamers. Uh, they're very effective tools to hydrate a barrel. Uh, the only thing I would like to point out when you do that is you are working with steam, glove up, be safe. Uh, it's really dangerous stuff and I've had steam burns. Just be careful with that. Next thing I want to move on to is basic barrel repair. And these are the tools that you need to have. Um, you need to have a head puller, which is the thing that looks like a little piece of a hoop and that's what you can make it out of. Uh, and that's what you're going to use in order to hook the head and pull it into place. Um, I've got some videos. Uh, I was going to go into detail, and I found these videos from Sowery that they've posted online. They're 100 times better than I could ever do. So uh, go ahead and watch them. Uh, they're linked up in Canvas. But uh, I want to talk about tools you need. And so you can buy a really expensive one of these. Uh, they cost you like $100, uh, or you can make one for like nothing out of an old barrel hoop. Uh, I'm sure you all can figure out some place to find them. The other thing you need is a really good uh, sledgehammer or mallet, uh, and then you need a driver. And these drivers are also really, really expensive and they wear out really fast. What you can do is go get a metal chisel from uh, you know any local hardware store, Home Depot, 
And then what you can do is just grind off the edge so that you have a little bit wider piece. So you get a good, good cold chisel and grind off the edge. And you can create a really fabulous driver for, um, you know, 20 bucks instead of uh, 150. And then you'll see my little bent pipe and you're like, what the heck do you need a bent pipe for? Well, when you can't get that head in place perfectly, you can take that pipe and you put it through the bung hole and then you pop the head from underneath and that'll help pop that head in place. So a uh, very effective uh, way to do it. And we call that a bump, uh, just to bump the head up into place because you'll never, very rarely do you ever pull that head right in place perfectly and get the uh, uh, hoops set in time. So um, for basic barrel repair, a uh, couple things. If you have a brand new barrel, just go ahead and call the barrel person who, bought, who you bought it from. If you fill up a barrel and it's leaking all over the place um, and it's uh, new and you've, you've done some hydration to it, but it's still leaking, like you've got some holes or some places that the barrel's just not sealing, call the barrel uh, person that you bought it from and they'll come out and fix it. Um, then also ask frequently if anybody has barrel repair kits. Um, hoard them if you can. Uh, they come with a lot of neat little tools and ways that you can uh, repair your barrels. Um, and then uh, go ahead and see those links in Canvas for head removal, chine leaks, and head leaks. Um, we'll take you, uh, I think they're only you know a few minutes each, uh, but really, really good uh, from Sorry Coopers. Uh, and that is it for basic barrel repair. We'll move on to tasting next.